We're going to observe communion, as it's often called. Communion is when the people of God get to share and partake in the remembrance of what our Lord did for us. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul tells us that when the church gathers and when the church observes communion and when the church takes the Lord's Supper, we're, we're doing a couple of things. First of all, we're remembering. We're remembering what he's done. And secondly, we're proclaiming what he's done. And so as we do this together, we are <clears throat> reminding our hearts and minds and our conscience about the work of Christ. And we are professing that the work of Christ on the cross applies to us. We're proclaiming that as long as we partake until he comes back. And so this is an indeed such a sweet time of our service to be able to do that together. And to prepare us for that, I want to direct your attention to a passage in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And this text has shepherded uh, my heart. I'm sure it has shepherded your heart as we think about the cross work of Christ and we think about how it applies to us. You could say that we could look at the cross and talk about the objective aspect of the cross. Objectively, what happened? Christ died. And the death signified that wrath was being poured out on the Son. And then, objectively, he rose from the dead. There is a literal empty tomb. And that signifies that God's wrath was satisfied and that Christ conquered death and paid for sin. But the question also remains on the subjective side of how do we know and how do we appropriate the benefit of the cross? How do you benefit from Christ's cross work? And this passage focuses on on that reality. How do we benefit from the cross? In Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says, We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Now that's a that's a verse that, you know, it comes in a context where Paul has just confronted Peter. He's confronted him about his hypocrisy. He calls it hypocrisy in verse 13. That It actually was so influential it even carried Barnabas away. And what was happening was Peter and Barnabas, the Judaizers, and even some of the Galatians, they understood the gospel. They understood that justification is by faith alone. But they began to walk in a way that was inconsistent to that. And so in verse 15, when you read Paul saying, we are, not Jews by, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles, just read sinners with, you know, dripping with sarcasm. Sinners. So we're not those filthy sinners. We're, we're Jews by nature. And then verse 16 picks up the shocking contrast here. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed. Even we, even Jews by nature. And so you can tell in verse 16 when he says, we're Jews by nature, not those sinners among the Gentiles. It's just dripping with sarcasm because he's like, so the point is, Galatians, you know that you, even though you are Jews by nature, you know that you have nothing for your good standing except Faith in Jesus Christ. You know, any form of legalism is bad, but our forms of legalism might even be worse than Peter's because Peter here is actually resorting to the Old Testament law. It was attractive to start with justification by faith and maybe even be tempted to think that somehow Peter might be thinking, if I do What is distinct to me as a Jew, that would increase my standing with the Lord. If I did those things, I might put a bigger smile on God's face. Or if you look back at this last week and you're sensitive to sin in your life, where your heart and your mind or your will fell short of God's righteous standard, you might be tempted to think, if I just did some tangibles, if I just did something, there's something I can come up with in my own ability to to overcome that, to compensate. It might increase my standing before the Lord. And that's, that's, where, Paul, that's where Peter was, con- was compromising. And so he's confronting that. And in verse 16, he explains three times, you cannot be justified by works of the law. Verse 16a, man is not justified by works of the law. 16b, um, 
we are justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. 16c, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. And it's really helpful for us as we prepare to take communion, even to look at three statements about not being justified by works and to even look at the, the subjects of each of those verbs. First, he just says man. Man's not justified by works of the law. Then he gets more specific in 16b, we are not justified by works of the law. And then in 16c, he uses the word flesh, since no flesh will be justified. Now, those all three mean the same thing, but they have distinct connotations. No human being will ever be justified by works of the law. Paul says to the Galatians, you and I, first person plural, we will never be justified by the works of the law. And then, no flesh will be justified by the works of the law. This pictures man in his sinful, depraved nature. Man in his innate, natural ability will never be able to arrive at a position where he would be declared on good terms before a holy God. It will never happen, it never has, and it never will. The only grounds for any man to stand on good terms with a God formerly offended is Christ. And the only means by which Christ's completely sufficient work would ever be applied to the individual is by faith. By faith. And so Paul explains that in the rest of this paragraph. And so quickly, just look at verse 17. If while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? And that question might sound a little foreign, but in this context, of course, the issue is Paul is seeking to be justified by Christ, but then he actually is going back to the laws that would distinguish Jew and Gentile, thinking he can put a bigger smile on God's face, and somehow he's starting to believe he can be sanctified by works. And Paul says, well, look, if you're going to pursue a relationship with Christ, and somehow in your pursuit of Christ and your table fellowship with Jew and Gentile because of your union in Christ that transcends those Old Testament distinctions, and you find yourself actually violating dietary codes, then did Christ just become a minister of sin for you because now you're violating Old Testament law? Answer to verse 17, no, not at all. Christ is not a minister of sin. Of course, two reasons why that's true. Verse 18 is a negative. If I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. And so he's talking about rebuilding Old Testament law, which points out the righteous standard of God, and it was indeed a practical code of conduct for the people of God for millennia. But now here in the church age, it indicts Peter's self-righteous, inconsistent application of justification. And so now he's believing he's being sanctified by, by works. And looking at those works from the Old Testament law, he has rebuilt the law as a means of merit. And all that will ever do is prove you're a transgressor. Verse 19, positive reason why Christ is not a minister of sin, because through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. Through the ministry of the law, the Christian is exposed and indicted and acknowledges that All I have in my flesh is the inability to earn God's wrath. Paul said it this way. Those who are in the flesh cannot submit to the law of God, and they cannot please God. I have a lot of human ability. I have the ability to resist God's law. I have the ability to displease God, and that's pretty much where my ability stops. When it comes to justification, we have no ability. Your good standing with a God formerly offended is grounded exclusively in Christ, and it's applied to you exclusively by faith. The result of that, verse 19c, is so that I might live to God. To live to God, what's that look like? He explains in verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. When we partake of the Lord's Supper here in a minute, you are remembering and proclaiming that you've been co-crucified with Christ and co-resurrected with Christ. And so he says, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ now lives in me. That's what it means to live to God in verse 19. What's it mean to live to God? It means I'm no longer living according to my own ability. I'm I'm not relying on my own strength. 
The power and the effectiveness in my life is not me. It's Christ in me. And the life which, Paul says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So Paul, are you living? Well, no, in the sense that it's Christ living in me. But yes, in the sense that the life that I do live in the flesh, it's just simply one by faith. I walk by faith. So verse 21 says, I don't nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Can I appeal to your conscience, believer? If you, if you look back at your life, and you look back at things in your life, and you look back at the inconsistencies in your heart and your mind, the, the very inconsistencies that are condemned by the law, and if your conscience is operating according to the principle of law, you'll come to the Lord's Supper condemned. But the law must condemn your flesh and your conscience must be informed by the law of being crucified with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. When it comes to your good standing, are you afraid that you haven't done enough? Are you concerned that you haven't merited God's favor? Of course you haven't. Of course I haven't. Christ did. And so, the living unto God is the inevitable result of believing unto justification, but there's nothing about our living that contributes to our justification. Your good standing is grounded in Christ. And so, Christian, if I can just shepherd your conscience here with this thought, faith is the exclusive means. And not even your faith is the ground. You cannot trust in your faith. If I had to trust in my faith, I would be hopeless because my exercising of faith is flawed and imperfect. But I have a perfect object of my faith, namely Jesus Christ, dead and resurrected. He died, but he's no longer dead. The tomb is empty, and I trust in him. And my exercising of faith is imperfect. It's not, it's not what it ought to be. But a weak faith that lands exclusively in Christ is the means of your good standing with God. And that's what we remember, and that's what we proclaim this morning. We're going to ask the men to come forward with um, the elements. And I just want to invite you, if you are visiting, and if you're not a believer, if you're not um, sure about where you're at with Christ, I would just invite you to let this pass. This is for the believer. This is for a family event, if you will. Here we are gathered as the church, and we've gathered to remember and proclaim our sharing and our partaking in the work of Christ for us. And so as they come, just you know, let them know how many, how many uh, elements you need. And, um, and then I will come back up here in just a couple of minutes and uh, pray for us. And feel free to take the elements um, as you decide.